Board of Education budget hearing for September 23rd, 2014. May I have a roll call vote, please, Madam Clerk? Present. Present. Here. 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 And I would like to introduce uh, Ms. Jen Hermes to take us through the uh, proposed budget. All right. Thank you, Mr. Anderson. Um, as I know it seems like a long time, but as many of you might recall, on July 22nd, the Board of Education did place a tentative budget on display um, where it's been available um, for inspection ever since. Um, what I want to do tonight, since we went through the budget in more detail in July, is we're kind of just do a refresher on um, the overall um, finances and also on some of the initiatives and an update on where we are with those particular initiatives. If you take a look, this is the overall revenues and expenditures for 14-15. Um, as you can see, the revenues are on the top. You can see our budget is $38,310,177. This year, our expense total, this is all funds, is $38,154.52. So we are projecting revenue over expenditures of approximately $159,000 and some change. The exciting part of this budget is a couple of things. One is I think that our process that we have utilized over the last few years uh, not only includes what are the existing programs um, that we need to maintain, what are we doing with our fund balances, where are we headed in the future, but also taking a look at some of our facility needs, which as you know, um, during the economic downturn, um, we put on the back burner for a while. And we have both our instructional highlights. This is the exact same slide you saw in July. And as you recall, Lauren and Lori provided information regarding some of these focus areas for this year. Um, pleased to say that those ones have already been completed, so that is, is really nice going forward. I know Lauren did work today on the new algebra, algebra curriculum, and I'm sure we'll be getting further updates on that. But as you can see, math, English language arts, the STEM inquiry. Um, pleased to say that we do have one of our smart labs installed at DPM, and we're looking at the second one uh, for installation during December. So that's a very exciting project. Inspiration Block, I believe that is on the board's agenda to hear an update um, on that this evening. Response to intervention and a look at our special education programs. Some of our facility improvements. Um, I had a wonderful opportunity last week. Everett School students sent me a handwritten, hand-colored, beautiful little invitation to come over and see what they're calling their new school. Um, because they're so proud of some of the improvements. Um, so I did go visit where I found out that Carol White, the director of Buildings and Grounds, is a rock star. They actually call her a rock star, um, but they were so excited. We were given student-led tours um, to show the things on this list, the replacement of the flooring at Everett, some new paint on the walls, new trim, just a, a refreshed look at, at Everett School. So if you've not had an opportunity to see that since it has been completed, Please take the time. It, it's, it's definitely worth the trip. Um, replacement of the main drive at DPM and the main and side drives at Sheridan, uh, which also included some engineering work that was, was much needed. Uh, replacement of the DPM lockers, all completed. As you know, we do a ton of our, our projects in the, in the summer before the students return. The installation of the 3M security film, I believe, is in progress and uh, should be completed shortly. So a really short um, budget hearing because we did a lot of the information in July. I do want to say that we do have copies available if anybody is interested. We have both the state form, which is the required form, and also what we call the District 67 pretty version, um, which slices the data in a little bit different way. Um, if anybody would like to have copies of that, just let us know. They are also or will be available on our website if anybody wanted to take a look at it that way. There were no fundamental changes from the tentative budget to the final budget presented here to the board as far as net revenues or net expenditures. We did do an accounting change of one expense just between two functions, but the net effect was, was zero. If there are any questions from the board, I'd be happy to entertain. Otherwise, um, also at this time, it's appropriate for a public to comment on, on the budget, which will be then adopted or up for adoption on the board's regular agenda this evening. Uh, Jen, the transportation line item, what is the formula based upon the fees that parents pay to offset that cost? Just sort of wondering what it would be if those bus fees 
were different, didn't exist? Yeah, I don't have the exact amount of those fees. I know originally at the time when bus fees were set, there was a philosophy set, which pre predates me, that the parent offset would be approximately 50% of the cost of trans uh, the transportation. That is not the case. It's not anywhere near 50%. Um, those fees have also remained flat, I believe, for the last several years. So we could e easily calculate that percentage and then let you know what that difference is. Mm -hmm. Jen, uh, you mentioned that we're doing some capital expenditures that were delayed during the recession, um, and I'm, I'm sure it's in the packet. I just, the capital expenditures plan now, how much are they up this year versus last year? I think it's up this year from last year about 600,000. Okay, so it's like 1.4. If you're just looking at uh, 13, 14 versus yeah. 14, 15, it's up from, I think it's about 600,000. So it's a big 700,000 to a million three, million four. What is that? Uh, like 50%. It's six, almost 60%. Yeah, okay. Starting like around a million, million three for the next couple of years. Okay. I think it, I can but if you look at one year, in my opinion, it, it, it's um, sort of random or arbitrary. I mean, I don't know that that number tells you a lot that, you know, one year to the next, it's up 60%. I think it's misleading. Uh, um, another question a lot of people ask is what is sort of a normalized number for our district for capital expenditures and it's like a million million one <clears throat> but it's going to get you know but it's lumpy you know and every 10 years or so as we discussed you're going to see a big blip up and then you, you'll pull back for a while so I, I don't think you can look at any one or two years and get a good picture of it right I think to answer both of those questions actually Leslie I do have it in, in front of me because it's in this version um, we have budgeted that we would take in about 335000 in fees, and our expenditures are just over a million. Um, on the capital projects, Rick, Rick is very close. If you look at the capital projects fund summary in that pretty version, as I like to call it, um, last year was 434000 spent in capital projects. This year we're at $1.3 So e e even bigger. And he is correct. I mean, we have some latitude over when those capital projects um, are conducted, which is exactly what we saw during the economic downturn. We got very lean. We didn't do things that weren't necessarily directly related to safety, where now you're seeing we're able to start working on um, coupling with the instructional initiatives to enhance the programs a little bit more, which is what we've seen um, at the Cube and, and things of that nature. Have we ever gotten back to the school safety Report. Tenure life safety? Yeah, 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 the life safety. Um, there will be a group of us going down to the architect's office on Friday. We've gotten some preliminary numbers, but that will be probably an all-day meeting to go line by line, project by project. And would that substantially affect this number at all? Or? It, it won't change this year's number. This year will be spent planning. It will definitely affect our number in our five-year projection and eventually our tenure. We had a sidebar on capital expenditures. Uh, <laughs> any other questions or comments from board members? Questions or comments from members of the public? Any other comments? Okay. Hearing none, uh, thank you very much. And could I have a motion to adjourn the budget hearing? So moved. Second. 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 Roll call vote, please, Madam Clerk. Mr. Schuler. Aye. Mr. Folker. Aye. Mrs. Clemenson? Aye. Mrs. Fisher? Aye. Mr. Lemke? Aye. Mr. Borkowski? Aye. Mr. Anderson? Aye. Okay. Budget hearing is adjourned. Okay. Now I'd like to call to order the City of Lake Forest District 67 Board of Education regular meeting for September 23rd, 2014. Could I have a roll call, please, Madam Clerk? Mrs. Clemenson? Here. Mr. Lemke? Here. Mr. Anderson? Present. Mr. Folker? Here. Mr. Borkowski? Here. Mr. Schuler? Here. Mrs. Fisher? Here. We have a quorum. Thank you very much, and uh, welcome back, everyone. The first item on the agenda is the President's report. When I uh, became President of this board last year, I sent out two areas of focus for the first year, uh, building a mission and vision for the district, 
and proper oversight of, of the district. As I said in one of my first reports, these are the two most important, these are two of the most important things for a school board to focus on. A vision for a public school system can only come from the community. After all, it's the community's children who are being educated, whose values are being taught, and which is in the, in the community which is responsible for most of the costs of the district. Similarly, oversight is an essential function, is an essential function which can only be performed by the board. A school district, like any other organization, can't be charged with overseeing itself. In addition, since the board sets tax rates, the board has a responsibility to ensure that the funds we spend educating our students are well looked after and that tax rates are set accordingly. As far as the oversight role goes, we should be appreciative of the work of Rick Schuler, who heads the Finance and Operations Committee, Mike Borkowski, Chair of the Policy Committee, and Robert Lemke, who held, heads up the first independent compensation committee for our district. The mission and vision work in our district has been led by Beth Clemenson, who's also done a great job. District 67, along with our cousin, District 115, spent much of last year listening to all of our constituencies, teachers, students, administrators, parents, board members, community members, everyone who has a role in this district or who's impa impacted by its operations. The resulting work has given those who are charged with running our district tremendous guidance which can be used to build a school system which is in keeping with the priorities, values, resources, and vision which Lake Forest has for its public schools. How will the work done on mission and vision be used? One possibility would be for it to be placed on a shelf somewhere and never looked at again. Another would be for it to be embraced verbally by district leaders but not make, it into their, make its way into their strongly held beliefs. In this scenario, some promising work would be started, but it would likely to be soon forgotten as the inevitable crisis or distraction arises. A third scenario would be for the work to be widely adopted, but for its impact to slowly dissipate over time as other priorities and influences become more important. The fourth and only way in which this work will see its true potential will be if those who lead the district truly take it to heart, think of it as a blueprint for the next 10 years, and dedicate themselves to bringing our community's vision to fruition. It's now up to the district, with proper oversight from the board, to put these words into a meaningful plan which works for the benefit of all our constituencies. That concludes the President's report. Uh, the next item on the agenda is the Superintendent's report. Mr. Simic. Thank you, and Mr. Anderson. If people didn't know better, they would uh, think that we had coordinated our comments. So I'd like to dovetail my report with yours. We have the, uh, the start of school and connecting with some things that uh, I discussed last year. I want to talk about the school rankings and these listings that come out. And there's been another buzz in the community, this time quite different from the last time, which was the sky was falling last time. Uh, this time we are, and according to one ranking, number two in the state and number 12th in the nation, and by another a person uh, to put this in context we are number 578 in the nation so you're either number 12 or number 578 uh, one of those two there's a lot of room in between those two the issue is it all depends on what is measured and the measure this time uh, happened to be by uh, a ranking in which we wind up looking very different than than we had in the past and that thing slides around from time to time and from year to year so in this case, it's a good buzz. Next time, we'll see what winds up happening. Our enrollment has taken uh, another interesting turn. We have uh, one, of the, one of the pleasant trends to see is that Sheridan School, which is our smallest building, is uh, one student down uh, from last year and only one student down from last year. District-wide, we are 51 students down from last year and one of the things that that happens with that is it's not noticeable it's not like two classrooms of children uh, move to Connecticut it's one student in this classroom and one student in that classroom and so on and so on uh, so this is um, uh, it's not uh, something that is going to have an immediate impact it may or may not have a cumulative impact depending on what winds up happening in the future in the district, we have some inter very interesting things going on. I was in a building visit this week and got to see the dedicated uh, the, the purchase from the Spirit, the climbing wall at Deer Path West in action. 
And in this case, it was an action uh, being used by the teachers who were being trained on the new, uh, the new learning tool. And uh, it was absolutely terrifying for them. Uh, and so one of the things that the trainer said was, if this is an activity, it's being used incorrectly because this is a learning tool. And the teachers were shaking and quaking and struggling and cooperating only by necessity because they were so terrified. What is it's a long four by four that's connected with uh, wires with another four by four. And, you, and there is a series of these, about five of them going up. And you can't get from one four by four to the next. So there's a climbing wall or some other tools that are associated with it. Uh, one of our teachers got to the top of the climbing wall and stopped at the top and said, I am done, and just let go. And, and he didn't fall, obviously, but he was just done, and he had reached a place where he just couldn't do it anymore. And two of the other teachers were going up from one four by four to the next, and the only way you can get there is through cooperation, because you can't reach up and grab it. It's too high, and so you have to work together. Uh, one of the things that uh, the instructor said was when they're up there, and it doesn't look like they're very far up there, they're probably uh, 10 feet off the ground, and they are just shaking and sweating like crazy. And everybody on the bottom is giving them directions. And the trainer said, uh, hey, everybody down here has been giving you directions. What's that like? He says, is that helping or is it noise? Total noise. And he stopped and he sat down and he said, this is what it's like for our autistic kids. All that direction that they're getting all the time means nothing to them. It's the one person they're interested in, and our teachers are up on the top, and they are focused on each other like laser beams. They got to the top. They got to sign their name on the top of the 4x4, four four, and down they came. And uh, one of the other things was, you know, what would you like to have happen at the end of this? Would you like to touch the top? And one of them said, no, I'd like a glass of Chardonnay. Um, <laughs> Another really impressive thing this year, and we'll see a presentation on it shortly, is the inspiration block. I've been so impressed with the commitment of the staff over the summer, their passion for the work, and the leadership that they have shown along with their principal. It fits in, hand in glove, with the aspirations of the mission, the vision, and the milestones. It is highly differentiated, inquiry-based, it's driven by student interests, and also, very importantly, it leverages the community as an asset. Parents are coming home and talking about how their kids are talking about people that they talk to, whether on Skype or whether in person, from the community and from across the nation. Also, another very interesting experience I too had a tour of Everett, and I would like to thank our students, Andrew, Hayden, and Robert, for their tour of the building. They read every note. They were very well prepared, and they were very fun hosts. One of the little guys had a bow tie on and a jacket, and I asked him why he had a bow tie on, because his mother told him to wear a bow tie, and so he did. And he'd also been very well trained, because at the end of it, uh, we knelt down to get a picture in front of the school bell, and a little guy came up behind me, put a hand on my shoulder, smiled appropriately, and out came all the cameras. Anybody that didn't want to have a picture got one anyway, because it was a great shot. Not of me, but of him. Uh, I also learned that Mrs. White, our director of building grounds, is an absolute celebrity in the building. Teachers have done a very nice job of letting our students know uh, why they're appreciative and to whom they should look to say thank you. Our mission and vision and milestones, strategic planning and communication over the summer, we spent a huge amount of time working on that. Had 55 people assembled in this room in June. We reviewed the district data and that same group assembled again in August, reflected on the data and looked at potential metrics. How would we measure our success? What would that look like? And also reviewed a variety of strategies. I'm very, very pleased and impressed to see the mission, vision and milestone reflected all across the districts. If you attended our curriculum nights, uh, the highlight, one of the highlights was the district tagline, educating without boundaries and learning without limits in the opening presentations. Parents have also emailed me and said, uh, my kids sent me this survey and asked me uh, if I had a growth mindset at the end of taking the survey. Talk uh, everywhere is of growth and of growth mindset and of risk taking in the in the kids' classrooms, from the kids. So the messages of that mission vision milestone 
uh, work is really getting out. It is an impressive rollout, and I think it's an indication of how the district processed and how it included a wide range of people, and also, very importantly, that we arrived at language that resonates with people, that is meaningful, and they can attach to it. Uh, importantly, this is the, uh, the beginning of the school year, and we are off to an exceptionally smooth start. Very, imp very impressed with a couple new undertakings uh, within each of our elementary buildings, and that is the launch of the Inspiration Block at Cherokee and also the, the terrific start that uh, Dr. Sopko has had at Everett, the warm welcome that she has received there. One of the nicest things that happened over the course of the summer that you can't script and you, uh, you can't tell people to do things like this. It's just too thoughtful as the staff on her first day did not walk in the building. They waited for her outside and clapped her in to her new building, which is a really great gesture. And uh, trying to find somebody that could fill the shoes of Ingrid Weimer and what a class act she was, incredibly hard, and Dr. Sopko has done a really, really terrific job already. So with that, that concludes the superintendent's report. Thank you, Mr. Simic. The next item on the agenda is public participation. Are there any members of the public who would like to address the board on an item of their choosing? Oh, sorry. Seeing none. Uh, we move on to reports and discussions. The first item is um, a report on the inspiration block uh, from Ms. Jackson. Good evening. Thank you for having me. I'm really inspired to come here and to update you on the progress of the inspiration block at Cherokee School this evening. In May 2014, the board approved the first year of a two-year pilot of the Inspiration Block for Cherokee Elementary School. And after many hours of work this summer um, on both the scheduling as well as curriculum writing, we have students in kindergarten, third, and fourth grades attending one of the two Inspiration Blocks on a daily basis. When we did our summer work, we wanted to start with a common vision for each block of time. and. Um, the, the vision is outlined there. I think it's really important to note that each of the starting places really um, firmly aligns with the vision for District 67 in that um, the statements for both the inquiry block and the language acquisition block um, begin with allowing for learning without boundaries. Um, both blocks address standards in science and social studies. Um, the inquiry block uh, focuses on real-world problem solving and inquiry-based um, learning. Uh, the, the curriculum was written um, using the project-based yeah, project learning framework, or PBL, we call it for short. Um, and, and the PBL framework begins with a driving question, so an overarching question for a unit. And then um, it, through an entry event or something to start the unit, you might think of it as like a field trip or an interview with somebody, um, then it, di it helps students to dive in deeper through questioning and, and explore different avenues within that thematic area. Um, the inquiry block also uh, plays on the 21st century skills of collaboration, critical thinking, and communication. Kids are working in teams. Kids are researching together. They're asking each other questions. Um, and, and this was what our vision was to start. Um, the language acquisition block, again, it allows for learning without boundaries. It, again, it addresses science and social studies standards, um, but through a content-based nature. So students are immersed in the Mandarin language um, during this block of time. And we are really focused during this block in providing students authentic opportunities to use another language so that if they were placed in an area in China where Mandarin is the native language, they would be able to be functionally proficient. So they would be able to communicate and make their way around. Just a, a quick overview of the setup. Um, kindergarten, uh, both blocks are 60 minutes of time in third grade. Uh, they're 90 minutes um, on the inquiry side. It's science and social studies again. Um, part of that block of time in third grade is, is world language, uh, two days a week, and in fourth grade, three days a week. So um, in fourth grade, students choose 
um, students who are in the inquiry block choose a world language to study from fourth grade through eighth grade. So that is still a part of that time. And then number corner is addressed during that period of time. Likewise, in the language acquisition block at science and social studies curriculum, Chinese language arts, and then number corner is also addressed. Um, this is what, uh, it, it's kind of a sample schedule might look like. So inquiry block, um, it, it's 90 minutes of time, but part of that time, this would be like fourth grade where they have world language three days a week and number corner on the alternating days. And then the, the bulk of that time is spent in the inquiry content area. Um, number or for language acquisition block, they do a warm up, um, which includes number corner, um, some calendar activities at the beginning, and then they move into the science and social studies content and the Chinese language arts. Um, I'm going to review just the overarching thematic units that were developed. Um, the curriculum writing is still in process. Uh, it, we did a lot of the writing over the summer and really firmed up the first couple of units, but. As we continue throughout the year, we want to be able to be flexible in our planning, so we're, we will accommodate um, any changes along the way. Um, it's also important to know that um, grade level teachers did the planning. We also collaborated with our science specialist at our school, and um, she collaborated with both blocks in the development of curriculum so that we were sure to address both science standards, the next generation science standards that were recently adopted, I think last year, 2013. Um, and then um, the, the C3 framework for um, social studies, which is college, career, and civic life. Um, for kindergarten, the, the inquiry block is beginning with a unit learning about the habits of mind, which you'll see that's repeated throughout. Um, and then uh, for the language acquisition block, it's a parallel um, talking about some of the things that make us who we are, but um, more providing a foundation for language learning. So uh, basic greeting, social language, I'm, I'm five, I, I like school, things like that. Um, and then moving into a community unit, people in the community, the community around us. Um, the next unit is more focused on, on science, so looking at magnets and exploring magnets and force in motion, then moving to a, a holiday exploration, um, further on plants and animals, weather, and then environment and trees. So you can see that some of these units bend more towards science and some bend more towards social studies, and then some naturally integrate the two. So um, for example, the, the plants and animals unit would involve the, the surrounding area, let's go explore the community outside of the school building, let's see what's around us. For third grade, uh, similarly, the units are um, pretty parallel in, in their focus, um, addressing, again, the same standards, but just doing it in a little bit different way for each of them. So um, the third grade inquiry block started out with the inquiry process and what is it like to ask a good question or what makes a good question. Um, kids were researching what would make a good class pet and were able to do enough research to convince their teachers to get a class pet. So um, that was a really exciting uh, time last week for the inquiry block. Uh, then they're also going to look at what makes an effective team and teamwork and habits of mind. Um, and then while they're doing that, the third grade uh, language acquisition block is looking at habits of mind and weaving that throughout traditional Chinese literature. So they will actually be um, using the Chinese literature that they are reading to develop their own stories and dramatizations of the habits of mind and pick one habit of mind that they're going to display. Um, then they're going to move into a unit on animals and ecosystems and um, in, in the surrounding area of Lake Forest or in China and um, look at how animals and, and just ecosystems in general are affected by the landscape of both of those places. Um, third grade inquiry block is going to take a look at Thanksgiving myths and misconceptions. Um, while the language acquisition block does a comparison of Native Americans and, and the ancient Chinese. And then um, finally, another uh, unit that we will be looking at is bridges and force in motion. And finally, for fourth grade, um, again, you'll see similar parallels. 
Um, the, the language acquisition block is doing a similar unit for habits of mind in Chinese literature um, just to start off the year. And then um, the inquiry block in fourth grade has been really fun, um, it, it, looking at teams and how they work. Um, talking about learning without limits and educating without boundaries, our kids have been Skyping with professional athletes. We've had people come to school tomorrow, I believe, uh, Lake Forest is cutting down a tree and talking about how tree cutters work together as a team in front of the school building. So it's a mini field trip outside of the classroom. Um, and the kids are great because they, they have developed interview questions and I was even interviewed um, about teamwork. And from there, they're going to look at themes and, and take that into a presentation on teamwork and effective team building. Um, Further on, a, a more social studies based unit is five themes of geography. So we'll look in the inquiry block at how geography, um, the five themes are affect different regions in the United States. Um, language acquisition block, we'll look at China as our geography base. Um, sun, wind, and water, and alternative forms of energy. Um, again, surveying different regions in, in both areas and how natural disasters shape the landscape of both the United States and China. Um, and then in fourth grade for the last unit, um, it's looking at the, the E, the engineering in STEM, so playground design um, and what makes effective playground equipment. Um, and then for the language acquisition block, looking at the Harbin Ice Festival um, in the northern regions of China and building ice and snow sculptures using the same principles. Um, both of our, our new uh, Mandarin teachers are from that region, so they have firsthand experience. Um, when we approved the, the first year of the Inspiration Black of the two-year pilot, um, the, the first and second grades uh, were to receive a taste of inspiration. So currently, students in first and second grade and also kindergarten um, still go to science. Um, kindergartners go one time a week for a half an hour, first graders are two times a week for a half an hour, and second graders are um, two days a week for 45 minutes. Um, so they spend, it, the, the partial immersion program still exists in first and second grade, so students spend half of their day in the, in, in the English language for their English language arts instruction, and then the other half is math instruction in Mandarin, like it has been in the past. Um, students in the the traditional classrooms have a, a taste of the inspiration, and I'll show you sort of what that looks like. Um, the teachers, because the kids are still in science, decided to first look at social studies units, and they redesigned them using that project-based learning or PBL framework. So um, instead of having the field trip at the end of the unit, might have an entry event at the beginning of the unit where kids can get a, have a common experience and then explore. Um, some of the units first grade looked at is habits of mind. So we're, again, using that common language throughout the school building. Um, Kevin Henkes, author study in Pilgrims. Um, and then second grade, the example of the unit that they used is a landmark unit where the students actually become travel agents, do some research through the inquiry process, and then convince their parents to take them on a trip. Uh, one of the things that our fourth grade teachers especially have been using with their classrooms are glows, questions, and grows. So glows are things that are going well for during your research process or your inquiry process. Questions are questions that are still out there that you need to answer. And grows are things that you need to grow in the process. So some glows for um, the inspiration block. Our students are engaged. They're excited about learning. There's a lot of real life application in both of the blocks. Interdisciplinary, students in both blocks have been saying, oh yeah, this is what we did during whatever block I was in, and they're transferring that to their English language arts or to their math. And learning from the larger community. Well, I explained a lot of what the fourth grade and the third grade has been doing with the inquiry block. Um, our students in the language acquisition block on Thursday are going to have a visit from some high school students who are actually in Chinese one and two classes. Um, and they're going to come and have conversations with kids that are in um, the, the language acquisition block and um, hopefully learn a little bit from our students and our students will have the experience of teaching them a little bit. So 
some questions that still remain. Um, how will we know it's working? So right now we're, we're discussing what does evaluation look like? What measures are we going to use to know that we are succeeding? And included in that would be um, some climate surveys. Um, both in the school and in, in the larger community, and then also looking at achievement and are our students really meeting the goals that we've set forth for them. Um, language proficiency, sorry. That was um, a question that has come up through the process. How does the, the setup of the language acquisition block affect language proficiency? So we are working to answer that. We've set some goals um, for end of year goals, both in, well, in reading, writing, um, listening and speaking for the students at the end of kindergarten, third grade, fourth grade. Um, last year we did a random sample of the Apple test for language proficiency, if you recall. Um, we plan to do that for all fourth graders at the end of this year, so that will be another um, instrument to use to measure how students are pr progressing along the language proficiency scale. And then how will students learn science in another language? And that's a big question that keeps coming up. Um, and, and again, through the curriculum writing process, we are using the standards that have been adopted already um, in GSS and, and the C3 standards. Um, and, and we will be assessing along the way to make sure that the kids are meeting those standards um, through classroom assessments um, and projects, performance-based assessments. And then as we grow, um, we continue to implement professional development for our staff members. Um, it, again, it, developing a program evaluation plan. We increase time for collaboration with all of our teachers. Um, they've been so wonderful about giving time, working together, um, developing new ideas. It's been a really exciting time at Cherokee. Um, and then commun continuous communication. So that's part of the reason that I'm here tonight. Um, I think I've given this presentation maybe four times now, so some people may be bored. Um, but it, it's, it's really important to the process that questions are answered and that we continue to communicate updates along the way. So be looking for that as we continue. And we're really inspired and we hope that you are. I'll take any questions if you have any. <coughs> Kelly, um, I was glad you addressed the evaluation issue, but could you or Mike or both of you talk a little bit more about how at the end of the year, it's way too early, but <clears throat> at the end of the year, how will the evaluation be made and who will make it? And will we decide to continue with the program after one year or do we wait for two years to make that decision? I'll let Lauren handle this one. <laughs> or Lauren. Uh, Kelly and I will be working together to create the program evaluation. We're looking at three components. One is climate, and both in the school and the community. Two is language proficiency for the students in the language acquisition block. And three is reading and math achievement for all students. So right now, those are the three areas we've identified. Um, it's possible a few more might creep up, but that, those are pretty much our indicators. Um, so starting with the end in mind, we'll work backwards in terms of timing. Um, in order to extend, because this was a one-year pilot of a two-year phase in plan, so we would want to come back to you, I would say, no later than April at the latest with the results of the program evaluation. So it's, the timing isn't always perfect, right? The reading and math achievement might be from winter scores. It won't be from spring. Um, but we can give you progress, I think, enough, hopefully, to warrant approval for the second year of the phase in um, and then evaluate at the end of next school year because then it, the program will be complete in terms of K through four. Perfect. That was a good explanation. <laughs> Kelly, I wanted to say thank you to you and the staff. You guys really were rock stars. You worked extraordinarily hard over the summer uh, and really took what was a controversial issue in the spring and turned it into something really wonderful. We talk about owning the dinner conversation and Last night, my son came home and owned the dinner conversation talking about how in his group, the firemen came and they got to interview the mm -hmm. firemen, so thank you. Lauren, we talked a little bit at the Ed Committee, but maybe you can share for the bigger group, uh, knowing it's one year of a two-year pilot, but also knowing that if it goes well, we want it to be a district solution. Can you just talk about your noodling in your head about years three, four, five, and beyond? Sure. Yeah, yeah, no. I think the most exciting thing, and I shared at the Ed Committee, the most exciting thing about the creation of the Inspiration Block 
the reason we were so literally over the moon, like buying out Starbucks with their inspiration mug, um, just at the thought of not only resolving some of the strife and concern, but also creating something that aligned perfectly with the district mission and vision. So, and as it's playing out, which we should never take for granted having a principal who is capable of carrying it out to this level, uh, it, is, it is proving to be, even in this short amount of time, exactly what I think a lot of us imagined in those months of planning with the mission and vision. So looking ahead, if the board approves the second year pilot, um, and next year we're able to see what the full year looks like, the full school looks like with this inspiration block, then we would want to give the other schools the opportunity to be inspired and to create their own inspiration blocks. What we also really liked about this plan is that it was structured enough to be replicated, but flexible enough to meet the unique cultures of each school. That was really exciting as well. So that, that would be the vision, is that all of our children have an opportunity to spend time each day where their subjects are integrated and woven together in a way that gives them choice and gives them the opportunity to pursue the project-based learning. Project-based learning is a perfect structure for our mission vision. So that would be the hope. I will say that teachers from other schools have already taken notice um, and we are not saying you need to wait. We're saying, hey, do you want the book on PBL? Do you want to think about redesigning one of your units? We're, we're here to support you doing that. So hopefully it'll be organic um, with a little bit of gentle direction from the district. Other comments from board members? Well, I just when I think of where we were sitting here six months ago and everything and where we've ended up, it's just remarkable and great job by everyone who's been involved with that. So. Moving on to the next report, um, the 2015-2016 proposed calendar. Hi again. Uh, Lori and I are partnering on the calendar project. So we are um, behind in our approval of a 1516 calendar. So we're glad to catch up by bringing you a proposal this evening, um, but giving the board time to think um, and gather input over the next month and then hopefully approve in October. Soon after that, we'll be coming to you to talk about the following year's calendar. Calendars can always be amended, but it is typical for districts to have the following year's calendar up by um, really almost just a few months into, at the most, of the current school year. Um, so we also, in creating this proposed calendar, really took into account uh, the board's request for us to step back and take a different look at school programming. And I think what really stood out for us a couple of months ago is when you shared concerns about the um, what seemed like a lot of disruptions throughout the school year, it, it dawned on us that as educators, having been in the system for so long, that feels totally normal to us. We're used to half day here, in service here, institute here, parent teacher conferences here. That's the way um, it's, it's, it's always been. Um, but we really took to heart your request for us to try to look at it differently. So what we've done is um, in this proposed calendar, we've bookended the years with three of our four um, institute days. We are allowed by law to take up to four full day teacher institutes. Um, we really want to take advantage of those. Uh, they are very valuable time, but we have front loaded two of them, put one at the end of the year, and then um, continued to keep our tri district day on the calendar. We feel that's a really valuable opportunity for the three districts to come together. Um, we've also have two half days throughout the year. Um, so we feel that is, that is minimal um, compared to years past. This current school year is also two, and that was because, if you recall, we amended the calendar in June per, per the board's request. Um, so we feel like 
we're in a better place with half days. We're not exactly where we want to be in the end, but in the meantime, we have um, a committee working headed by teachers to look at parent-teacher conferences and really, again, examine a practice that has been in place for a long time and ask ourselves, given technology, given power school, given the amount of time that, that teachers and parents might meet informally, is this current structure the best that it can be? Does it meet our current needs? Um, we are still having the minimum number required days by law. And I know that was a concern that the board shared as well. Um, if that is something we wanna look to change, that would be something that we would want to plan uh, for in future budgets with our, with our um, business office. Just a comment on that. I had spoken to Ben Gray, the LFEA president, after the comments were made regarding um, why are we going with the minimum Mm -hmm. And his response, and it would be great to have some numbers on this, he felt like other than perhaps Chicago, CPS, Correct. all of our counterpart districts participate right. in the same number of days that we are. Yeah. And we, we could easily contact the regional office to get that information, um, but my experience has been the same. Other questions about the calendar? We also took into account section 3.2 of the collective bargaining agreement, which talks about the work year, um, the number of days, et cetera. Um, I have a few questions, but while we're on this topic of 174 days meeting the state minimum, I swear I counted it three times and I came up with 173. Okay, we will double so check. Tell me. We've had several counters already, but uh, we'll, we'll, we'll check again. It should be 174 student attendance days, two full day parent teacher conferences, four institutes. The two half days count as student attendance days? Did you count those? No, I counted half days as half days. Aha, uh -huh. there you go. As long as it we're is. We're cheating. No, we're not, we're following the rules. I learned in math a half is a half, yeah. not one, so. Yeah. That's you you haven't difference. worked with the state of Illinois yet. That's the difference. <laughs> yeah, but I agree, the bigger issue is, is it 174 that we want, or do we want 175 or 180? At some point, I would like us to take a look at that, including the board. I would say that I really, when I received this, and it was great that the, re the way the reports came this month, very appreciated to be able to go through everything in detail when we were at home. I don't know if all of you felt that way, but this was, I thought, much more effective. So appreciated. Very happy to see the huge blocks of yellow that consistent so there aren't so many days lost in the middle of a week. Now, we can't do anything about the weather. I'm hoping we can control that too this year. Right. But um, looking at it right now, if you look at April and you look at May and you look at even December, at least it's consecutive days. Yep. So I think yep. that is a vast improvement from where Good. we are coming from. Good, we're looking for a cleaner calendar, mm -hmm. less disruptions, it, it does more look, consistent. It, it does look a lot cleaner. I definitely Good. like it better. Good. Um, if we're saying that half days are not as productive or not even half as productive as a full day, why keep two of them? Why not, if they're not as good, why not make them zero? Now, I know we had two last year and we still have two this right. year, so I don't see a big change in that. And right. I know what it entails. It means continued teacher-parent conferences after school. Actually, or, we, 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 did, we did change that in that <clears throat> the night that our teachers have conferences, they are teaching a full day. Um, the two half days remaining are for what is known as records time. And I know that's been something we've oh, right, discussed right, with right. the board before. It's a long standing practice in the district. Um, and that's something that at this time, um, so far in our time here, I think I speak for both of us when I say that we feel that that time is very well used and it's very important for teachers to have that time during the work day to come together um, it, and, and bring closure at certain points in the school year, prepare for reporting out to parents, um, um, grade assessments at the same time to look at inter rater reliability. So we feel that time is, is productive and that's well, the two but days. For instance, one of them is still a half day before a three day weekend. In fact, it's um, record day, a half day, and it's before the May 20, 
seventh right. weekend with the Memorial Day weekend. Right. I am not convinced that teachers can't do these, you know, the report card or, or record dates over the weekend on Monday. It, it's essentially a four day weekend towards the end of the year, kind of a critical time. It's a four day weekend for the kids. Yeah, I, I can, uh, I've had some conversations with, with teachers and this is a, uh, a pretty specific and pretty unusual ask on the part of our, of our staff, uh, particularly our elementary teachers who are doing a lot of writing at this time and, and putting things together that the, that the half day that they have uh, for the records is really a small, a very small portion of the time that they actually spend uh, getting all these things together so that, yes, they use that half day, they use all of it, and then they use the, the evenings and the weekends and so on as well. One of the things that, that, we, <clears throat> that, that we have to uh, take in mind in, in uh, regard to our calendar is that for the overwhelming majority of our teachers, uh, their day uh, does not end at 3.15 when the kids go home. Uh, and it, for, for most of our teachers, it is the case that in a lot of ways, the most important work they do is in the evening when they plan. Because if you plan well, you execute well. And there's a tremendous amount of work that, that gets done uh, outside the school day. Our school day, uh, historically, as I understand it, and if anybody has been around here longer uh, than I have and knows better than this, but as I understand it, uh, our school day was lengthened a number of years ago. We have a substantially longer school day than we had uh, not very long ago. And that was, uh, there were reasons that drove that. Uh, to compare us to CPS on that account, um, there's quite a difference in the, the length of, of our uh, two school days uh, with that as well. So this, this, these, these half day records days, these are really asked from our teachers saying, you know, hey, uh, this, this, is, this, this is something that's really important to them. I, I don't doubt that it's important, but if you, even if you could convince me that a half day is worth a half day of teaching kids, we're really at 173 days, mm -hmm. not 174. Mm -hmm. I mean, we joke about it, but we're at 173, not 174. Right. I think we're really at 171 or closer to that because of the two parent of anecdotal evidence and oh. just a half day is a little less than a half day. And I don't think the kids get the momentum. I don't think they take it as seriously. And so I'm where were you this taking is, the other two out? I, I, I know I'm not alone on this. I, I think oh. we're closer to 171 days of actual kid time okay. of being taught. Yeah. I know we have to move on soon. And maybe it would be good if we had clarification here. And I think we talked about this last time. As far as that last day in May, that's the half day, the records day, I believe in the past, I may be incorrect and we can clarify, this was a time um, principals had or have already at this time received recommendations from parents where they want their children placed in classes based on whether it be a teacher or a co-student situation. That articulation goes on throughout the grade levels, mm -hmm. through the elementary buildings. I'm not sure about DPM. That to me would be very worthwhile and they have to be in school to do that, the teachers. So that's a question that I have. Um, I don't know how you feel about that, but that feeling that, I say that's absolutely worth it. My other feeling is that these half days, and I know we brought this up to Renee and Tom, and I know as they're working on redoing and aligning their schedules, my hope is that a better alternative is arrived at for half days, whether that means one of those half days, we're just doing math and science. The other half day, we're gonna come along and just do a language social studies project. It goes along with our project-based learning. It goes along with a lot of the things we were doing. We could actually look at it as an opportunity to do something different and introduce That's different things. Right. Yeah, Leslie, thank you so much for bringing that up. Um, remember, we can approve a calendar, which I think is a service to the community in October. And then, based on the schedule that DPM comes and Tom and Renee will be coming to you, um, twice, both in October and December with updates, um, if it warrants a change. Um, and as you know, they're looking to build in more collaborative time for teachers within the school day, which K-4 has right now on a weekly basis um, with the early release and, and DPM does not. Right. So that could prompt us to be able to take another look at this. And we, we took notes. The purpose of tonight was to get this feedback. Um, so I, I wanted to 
I share some of Rick's concerns, and I'm glad that we're having the discussion now, and hopefully you have the opportunity as well over the next month to, to take some of this feedback to heart. I also was pleased that there seemed to be progress. I went through as closely as I could this year and last year, and I, I think we picked, we eliminated one half day and eliminated one full day off, so I thought that was progress. Um, the point on the disruptions, I think, I think the board, and certainly myself, when I talk about wanting five-day weeks and disruptions matter, I'm saying that because that's what the administration has taught me. That's not me coming up with that on my own. That's what I've heard you folks say and teachers say. Um, so so that's, it's, it's not our idea. It's, it's trying to strive for what I think you folks have said. So I've got three questions that I'm, I'm trying to keep them more at a philosophy level with real examples because I think that's a little bit more appropriate for the board. We talked about professional development philosophically being done primarily in the summer. Obviously, there are the Monday early dismissals and the, the late start at Deer Path and those things. Why do we feel that the tri-district day, you said it's valuable, and I fully agree that it's valuable. Why is it valuable in January versus in June? Mike has said that PD and right after the school year are some of the best PD around. Why philosophically is that better in January than in June? That's my that's something for us to think about. I mean, there, there, there are benefits to coming together mid-year mm -hmm. if some of the changes or, or, you know, outcomes of the discussion, but especially when you're looking at three different districts and you're talking about, uh, for example, last year's was on formative assessment. Teachers walked away with practical ideas, both from a presenter and from their peers that they could implement right away. Um, but it's definitely worth considering um, doing with Tri-District Day what we did with the other Institute Days. There, Thank there you. are some people that would say that you know, for, from, a, from a teaching and learning standpoint, mid-year can be optimal. At the beginning of the year, you know, teachers are, are thinking about getting the year up and running. So there's a school of thought that says, you know, they're fresh, they're, you, can, you, can, you, know, you can bring everyone together and do this development, but then there's some concern about how much will be implemented when, they, when they're just starting the year. Similarly, the flip of that is when you do it at the end of the year, they're going off to summer. So are they go yes, they can go and reflect on it, but they can't go back into their classroom the next day and implement. When you do something mid-year, particularly if you've been leading up to it with conversations at CAI or book studies, you can actually spend a day developing and then they can go right back into their, into their classroom and, and, and apply that. So I think that, and the, the, uh, the community-wide piece that we've done working with Lake Bluff and the high school, um, I think that has been, at least particularly last year, was very well received. So um, we thought to, to Totally on, to only bookend P, this full day PD with full staffs beginning and end of the year, we might be missing a key learning opportunity for the staff, and that was our that was our rationale. The uh, thank you. The my second question was um, you mentioned the parent teacher conference committee, which sounds fantastic, and that we need to vote on this in October, and that we can make changes later, but we never really do. Uh, do will we have the results of that committee work prior to October? No. But we, we do make changes. We, we, um, you amended the calendar in June for this current school year. So, I mean, that, that was a late change, but we, it, it's not possible to do a thorough review of the process by October, but we promised to bring an amended calendar if the discussions weren't one. And my last question is, when did spring break go from five school days to six school days off? I've, according to my calendar, it started, I guess, this past this cal current calendar year, but as far as I can tell, prior to this year, spring break's been a week, and now we've extended it to the following Monday, which causes the first week back a four-day week, a four -day week, which you guys have taught me is not a good week. Yep, I can, I can address this one. Uh, this is, uh, there, are a couple, there are a couple days um, in, in the calendar uh, that, that are uh, influenced by families and religious observance. Uh, one of those obviously is the winter break. You know, we schedule around major holidays there. When I meet with a ministerium uh, on an annual basis, one of the questions that they bring up is, look, uh, in terms of religious observation and working with uh, our, the, the, the observant families in our community, there are two days that they're uh, very interested in. One of those is Good Friday, and the other one is is uh, what they call Easter Monday, uh, that a great deal of families are traveling, and those are things that 
that I hear on a regular basis from them. And so as a nod to our traveling families uh, that, that oftentimes uh, it's accompanied with uh, religious observance, that Monday is an important day for them. That's, that, that was a, a change that I suggested in an original. The original draft did not have that in there. And reflecting the conversation I had with the, uh, the local ministers, we added that in. I think it might be interesting to go back 10 years and find out the average number of snow days we take every year and add those to the calendar going forward because that gives you a, pretty much a set date. You don't have to worry about these five floating days as much. And you get a couple extra days to help make up for some of the half days. Right now our contract limits us to the number of days that teachers can work. Fair enough. But I'm just it's saying it'd be, it'd be interesting to take a look at yeah. how many days a year on average we lose on top of what we've already got. Mm -hmm. And is there a way to be flexible enough in future years to... Mm -hmm. Because it helps the parents. It says this is your end date as opposed to, well, we might have two extra days here. And so okay. yep. be helpful. I think there's I, a purpose for those, uh, those lines there, the quarter, six, seven, eight, kind of to let parents know right off the bat that we do anticipate. And typically, I would say I never do need to be anywhere from two to five. But it's rare that you don't have a couple of cold and snow days. So um, more than likely, we'll, 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 very likely, we'll end up into that week of the six. But again, that's, that's a good way to uh, answer well, that's a good some, some years. Uh, that starting the week of the 6th would be uh, you're kind of rolling the dice a bit because more than likely we'll still be in school at that time. I just want to say I think you guys did a fantastic job taking all of our various feedback and rolling it <laughs> into a calendar for next okay. year. What I'd like to suggest, because I think there are some still some lingering concerns is that perhaps we set up some board workshop time. I feel like we have taken a lot of board um, time sure. to continually talk about snow days in the calendar and perhaps it would be better served in a workshop environment so we could, you know, have some meaningful discussion about conference time and some of those things. So, so to violate uh, what Beth just said, I want to ask one last question. <laughs> <laughs> um, what is the school day for the first day of school and the last day of school? Is it going to be this one hour and they're released, or is it a full day now? Right. So by law, the first and last day have to be full days. Um, so the plan. That's enough. Okay. <laughs> well, but but I have to say that in the past, including last year in District 67, I believe the last day was not a full day, and that's because the school banks enough time because our school day is longer than required to make that early release. That's a decision on the district's part. That's not. So the law is first and last days are full, but if you bank, so you have to plan with that, but if the district banks enough time, you can then make that last day shorter. So that's something we can talk about in the workshop as well. So this will be my last question to piggyback on Beth. <laughs> did we commit to a, did, did we commit to a workshop prior to the October vote? I heard a suggestion. Oh, I, I wasn't necessarily saying prior to the October vote because I thought what we were approving was this calendar, but it sounds like we have some bigger issues in terms of number of days, how we use conference time, planning days, professional development, um, and I think it might be helpful to kind of talk about all those things together as we, you know, work with our teachers on those things. Okay. I, I'm going to propose we move along. Is that... In the interest of this uh, meeting, not going for half a day. Um, but it would count uh, as a full day, Bill. <laughs> 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 Which means we can skip the I, we can skip the next meeting. We did take attendance. Uh, I, I, <laughs> no, I did I, take attendance, Lauren. I very much appreciate your listening to concerns of board members and sure. being so responsive. Our and pleasure. Thanks also to board members for all their questions and comments. The next item on the agenda, the next report, is uh, f on the fund balance uh, uh, policy. Uh, Ms. Jalvis? Ms. Um, maybe I can just jump into committee um, minutes from the finance operations meeting. It, the, it, let, let me it, clarify. Is there an official report on the fund balance? Or No, I was going to get to that in my oh, okay. committee uh, update. Okay. Uh, we, we're, we've decided 
to get to the punchline, we've decided to delay it one month, and I'll get to the reason for that. Perfect. Well, why don't then your report is coming up, so let's yes. just wait one second. Okay. Here. Otherwise, I'm going to get lost. That concludes reports and discussions. We now move to board committees. Uh, the first is the education committee, uh, Leslie Fisher. Okay, thank you very much. Our education committee meeting took place on Tuesday, September 16th, right here at West Campus Seminar A, and at 8.15 a.m. Uh, it was exceptionally exciting, and I want to thank Kelly, who is no longer here, at least in this room right now. <laughs> I sounded bad. I want, to thank, I want to thank Kelly for being there. Um, and for presenting, I loved, first of all, how I'm not going to go over what she presented here tonight because we definitely get the gist of it and um, was thrilled with her presentation, not only at the Education Committee meeting, but also here t this evening. I love how they, in the verbiage, it's now two inspiration blocks, one that is the inquiry block and one that is the language acquisition block. If you'll note, that's different from what it stood at last year, and um, I think that's great. Also, I thought it was interesting to note, she did not mention this this evening, but for the incoming kindergarten class at Cherokee, those who had the first opportunity to opt in to one of, choose either the inquiry-based or the language acquisition, 21 chose inquiry, 22 chose language. So if we can deliver that every year, that would be great. And finally, 26 students from the first Cherokee Mandarin subset will be moving to DPM in the fall of 2015 for advanced Mandarin program that is currently in the planning process. We also heard at the meeting from Judy Epke. She shared an update on the DPM Smart Labs. So if you haven't had an opportunity to stop by DPM West and see the Smart Lab that is installed in Mr. Polina's classroom, I would really encourage you to do so. I know about half of us made it to Northwood Junior High. It is the same Smart Lab um, from Creative Learning Systems. and. Um, it's, it's the same one. Um, chairs and paint are to come. Chairs that will be mobile, they are coming. And I know we don't want those stationary. They're already there. They're there. So the chairs are there. Is the paint on the wall? Paint's going to come. So they're deciding on maybe a very more you know, exciting color. OK, so that's good to know. Um, and the prep for the second lab to be housed at DPM East is underway. And teachers in smart lab leadership roles will undergo a four-day training at DPM East and will work with the entire staff and those actually more closely related to the Smart Lab to implement the lab on the east side. And as Tom and Renee revamp and further align the building schedules, maximization and utilization exposure to and of these Smart Labs is being considered as it should be so all can have access. Um, the maker movement was a subset of Judy's presentation that I know Mrs. Clemenson was sad to miss. But she did cite the website, and you'll see this in my notes. I encourage you to go there. It's http bit.do slash maker. And it, the article is how the maker movement is transforming education. It's really exciting, and it's a worthwhile read. Um, and that helped us better understand the ever-changing educational tools that engage today's students. Recap of that, we talked about fabrication devices, including the 3D printer. You'll remember seeing that at Northwood Junior High. Physical computing, such as robotics, makey makey. Google Glasses, and also programming. We participated in that last year, as, as did many other individuals and schools with the Hour of Code. Uh, we also discussed how to incorporate smart lab time and instruction beyond the Encore classes. This is something we've been discussing for about the past year, and it is a sticking point, and very, very important to discuss that. For instance, most of our band and orchestra chorus students miss out. They have a very limited time to have exposure to things such as the smart lab. Um, talked about integrating this into science classes, the usage of these smart labs, before and after school availability and clubs, brainstormers offerings um, was another suggestion. So a lot of ideas um, coming that can really expose our kids to these smart labs. And then uh, we had um, a presentation on the Common Core State Standards and also the preview of League of Women Voters presentation. Did you give that presentation this weekend? Because I saw the date and I thought you were out of town. Yeah, and uh, Mrs. Fagel and uh, Mr. Rubenstein, Dr. Rubenstein uh, presented that and two rave reviews. Wonderful, I'll yeah. talk a little bit about that. I just, I, yeah, great. Um, so the Common Core State Standards, and most of you 
may be sick of hearing about this, but um, it's something that we're going to continue hearing about. Um, it is a set of standards using a common language. It incorporates quality teaching practices and grades build upon each other. We can plug into it what we want. This seems to be polarizing nationally, but here the transition emphasizes what we are working towards and provides a clear framework of teaching of learning standards both vertically and horizontally. There will be um, an attached sample of a single um, English language arts common core state standard as represented throughout grades K through 12, measuring grades K, two, four, six. It'll be attached in the minutes that you can take a look at that. And it shows the vertical alignment of the common core. And I I truly don't think it's anything that you would disagree with or that you wouldn't want your children exposed to. All right, um, also I discussed how Mr. Simic and Lauren and Kevin Rubenstein will presented to on the Common Core of State Standards to the League of Women Voters on September 20th. Okay, a couple last points. Testing this year, just to be clear, NWEAs, if you have kids at the elementary levels, they've already taken them. Some are already completed with their fall NWEA slash MAP testing. Um, so fall, we have a baseline. In spring, we are going to give them again uh, as an opportunity to show their growth. The park test will be administered in grades three through eight in March and May. This is the state assessment that is replacing our ISAT. Um, pros of this, challenging tasks, that it replaces the ISAT, that it is aligned with Common Core state standards and that we will not be teaching to the test, and it utilizes computer skills. The cons, of course, is the validity is unknown. This is new, and that the testing process seems more lengthy than what we are used to. Update on summer 2014 curriculum work. Uh, learning targets, meaning the essential questions, assessments, and learning plans, the strategies and resources are where this curriculum work was focused. Accurate, current, updated each summer, alignment to, uh, to Common Core state standards and vertical alignment, parent, student, community access to curriculum in the fall of 2015. So we've been hearing about this Atlas curriculum mapping program that is really an online, um, in real time where changes are made. Uh, Lauren talked about the plan being for every summer, a big bulk of the summer work will be updating that by subject, level, by subject, by grade level, and by fall of 2015 to have it open to students, parents, and community members to see what is to be accomplished each year. Also worked on, we heard about this a little bit beforehand, add plus advantage, math recovery to measure the narrow skills and protocol. The protocol is already in place for interventions for children struggling with math um, achievement. Additional discussion was that Lori Wilcox discussed SB7, which we're going to continue to hear a lot about. This is going into effect the 2016-2017 school year. This basically means that assessments need to be incorporated into teacher evaluation. So we're gonna have to plug that into our teacher evaluations. And there was not public participation and our next meeting is Tuesday, November 18th, 815 West Campus. Thank you. Was there anything you wanted to add? Okay. I have a question. You said that um, elementary classes took the NWEA. Is that one through four or is that all the way through? I know that my children have already taken at DPM. I don't know about L and they take it all the way through the eighth grade? Okay, that's what I thought. I'm not sure what elementary means anymore. What, what, what classes are K through eight, okay. Thank you, uh, Leslie. The next item on the agenda is uh, Finance and Operations Committee, uh, Rick Schuler. Okay, um, tying back to our new policy, which you'll recall we adopted last spring with regards to the funds balance report, um, you'll recall we're looking for our fund balance to be in the 10 to 15 percent range. Um, long story short, Alan at our last meeting introduced us to our architect uh, who's working on the life safety requirements and the associated costs. And a long story short, they're not ready. He, he's not done. He's got. Um, a list of items, he hasn't gotten it down to final costs. And as importantly, <clears throat> our, the Finance Committee is asking of those required expenses, which ones overlap 
with expenses already in our five-year budget, meaning they're already in the capital expenditure line item. For instance, roofs have to be replaced or repaired. That can be a life safety issue in addition to it's just our ongoing maintenance. So at this time, we're not sure how much to add in for costs for the life safety requirements being recommended by our architect. <clears throat> he thinks another two or three weeks will be required to get the detail, the costs, the timing, and in addition, the, o the amounts that overlap with what's already in our budget. Once that's done, and that's been uh, committed to prior to our next board meeting, um, we'll be able to update the five-year budget. It'll have a lot more meaning to it, and then we can really look at our fund balance and uh, feel like that's a, a much better projection that's incorporating everything without redundancy. The expectation is still that once these incremental expenses only are accounted, our fund balance surplus will likely erode over the next five years. Now, I use the word erode. I don't mean to um, get your antenna up too much. We also believe that we'll keep it in the 10 to 15 percent range. But without these expenses factored in, our balance goes to 19, 20, I think all the way up to 24 <clears> percent. <throat> so this is an important number. And to give you the report now would be sort of meaningless. Um, but I do assure you that if we do think we will do things right and we will keep the fund balance above 10 percent despite these added expenses or at least on my watch we're not going below 10 percent you can write that down um, <laughs> yeah. um, also in relooking at our five-year budget Alan reported that Jennifer and Brittany <clears throat> were spot on with regard to budgeting for several open positions recently filled, teacher positions, that is. Jennifer reported that there are no changes to the total revenues and expenses from the tentative budget presented in July, which we just approved. Uh, Jennifer and Brittany, if your forecasting abilities are that good, do they translate to football predictions? Because I could use them this weekend. You. you did. <laughs> I want to talk to you tomorrow. OK. Um, also, Elizabeth Hennessy was nice enough to come back to uh, another one of our meetings. She's with William Blair, and she presented a market update for the debt refinancing. She explained that the parameters resolution, which authorizes the board president and Allen to move forward with the debt refinancing under specific parameters. The resolution will be presented to the board for approval later in this meeting. Um, I think those are the highlights. We'll have a lot more to add in a month after we get the architect's report and the updated budget. Any questions? Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Schuler. Uh, Policy Committee, Mike Borkowski. The Board Policy Committee met on September 8th. Uh, we first held a joint meeting with 115 to discuss a batch of press policy updates. These are the items recommended by the IASB or required by statute. The admin team presented background on each of the items. The group discussed each appropriately and consensus was gained. These will be brought before the board later this evening for a vote. The joint meeting adjourned and we continued with the District 67 Policy Committee meeting. We first discussed Policy 5, 30 regarding HR and personnel hiring procedures and processes. We had a good discussion regarding breadth of hiring searches, development of partnerships, and what should be considered policy versus administrative practice. We discussed that a more robust plan would be delivered um, to the board in December. So at that point, we'll start to understand what should be policy and what should be admin practice. We then discussed policy 5330, which covers educational support staff. Jen will be bringing suggested modifications to a future policy committee meeting and also discussing with Jeff to ensure all the concerns are appropriately addressed. Lastly, Eileen reported that a central repository for all admin practices now exists in the form of a Google Docs drive. The objective here is for all administrative practices to reside in one place for ease of access and continuity. There are currently two documents in the repository, and everyone is encouraged to send Eileen 
any other administrative practices you have. That concludes the policy committee report. Any questions from board members? Thank you very much, Mr. Burkowski. Uh, next item on the agenda is the compensation committee. Uh, uh, Mr. Lemke. Uh, the compensation committee has not met. Thank you very much. We now move to liaison reports. These are organizations to which uh, board members serve as liaisons. The first is the North Suburban Special Education District, Mike Burkowski. The NSSED Governing Board met last on August 27th. One item of interest to our board is that the NSSED Finance Committee reported that they are now beginning to examine f various financial models, including looking more at the pay-as-you-go approach that we desire. Uh, related to this, the District 67 administrative team is working with the NSSED staff to define our desired state regarding this and our overall relationship with NSSED. This work's being done in conjunction with Districts 115 and 65. The next NSSED Governing Board meeting will be on October 8th. That concludes the NSSED Board Report. Thank you very much. The next item on the agenda is Illinois Association of School Boards, Ed Red, uh, Bill Anderson. There is no report this month. Um, the next item on the agenda is uh, Curriculum Coordinating Committee, um, Leslie Fisher. I was really looking forward to that report from Ed Red, but I'm sorry you don't have one this month. Um, curriculum Coordinating Committee, I'm assuming, is going to meet in October? October 23rd at 4 p.m.? Oh. So continue to bring applications in in order you continue to accept applications for Curriculum Coordinating Committee. Okay. Send them to Lauren. Okay, through this Friday. I look forward to being there. Spirit of 67 Foundation met September 9th at 9.15 a.m. And Mike, as he often does when he visits parent groups such as the Spirit and the APT, he reiterated the key focuses of the year, growth, support, and yet, meaning we're not quite there yet, we're still working towards it. And um, these were echoed throughout both meetings and I also, specifically being at Open House on the DPM West side, heard that over and over again in every classroom that I went to, which I thought was remarkable. I actually, uh, I think, called Mike or emailed him right as I left, saying every single classroom I was in, and I have two kids on different teams, said growth, support, and, for, and yet. We're going we're gonna to work. We're, you're going to get frustrated, and we're going to work through it. Um, the support component, I think, is important, too, as... There is so much support in place at our schools. And if your teachers did not get that information out, the teachers that I heard did get that information out, whether it's they want your students to email them to meet them before school, stay after school. At Deer Path, on both sides of the building, there are homework after school clubs four days a week, um, led by teachers who are right there. There is a writing resource center two to three days a week, and there is a math resource center two to three days a week. Some of these resource centers are partnered with the high school kids who come over um, and help the middle school kids. So support is, is key. As we are supporting our teachers and all they are learning, um, we are supporting our students. So Mike also talked about working on the strategic plan this summer and um, talking about, as Kelly um, brought up today, that a Gallup poll or a similar tool measuring well-being may well be in store um, as a form of assessment in our near future. And he also identified the important work done in the summer, the progress on the STEM labs, alignment of the DPM schedules, and the Everett Building improvements. Uh, the next community book talk, I believe, will be Mindset. Um, with author Carol Dweck scheduled to speak. Do we have a date when she is supposed to speak? We don't. We are waiting for t to hear back. We have a commitment that, that uh, Dr. Dweck will come, and we would not have that, by the way, if we weren't partnering with LEAD. Uh, that's Great a really important thing to point out. It's, it's one of the really good things, so we're waiting. We've sent dates, and I really thank Andy Duran for all his hard work on that, and we're waiting to hear back on those two best dates for us. Wonderful, and if you haven't, I was fortunate to be part of the strategic plan and received a copy of Mindset, as did many of the people who were on that committee. If you have not read that book, I highly recommend it. Uh, the fall luncheon, benefiting the spirit, as you know, the spirit has two events each year. 
um, in addition to the um, membership fees that bring in monies for the spirit, there's the fall luncheon, and then of course there's the home tour, which is in May. The fall luncheon is scheduled for Friday, October 17th at Exmoor, um, 10.30 to 2 p.m. Great auction items. It's gonna be a wonderful morning and afternoon as it always is. And the spirit board will meet again on Tuesday, October 14th at 9.15. Thank you. Thank you, Leslie. Are there questions or comments from board members? Then we move on to the next item on the agenda, APT. Uh, Leslie. Okay, so the APT Executive Board met on Wednesday, September 10th at 9 a.m. here at West Campus. Allison C.K., the president, was absent. However, Vice President Tiffany Wiesner announced that this year's theme, determined by Allison, will be resilience. As you may recall from last year, Allison's theme was balance. This year's is resilience, very much in line with the mission, vision, goal and process as she was a big part of that. Um, Mike, of course, discussed the things I've already said and a couple of notes. Time zone is currently on hiatus and I know that this has struck some people um, in the district unfavorably. However, although classroom teachers have access, they do have access to supplies and lessons in the interim if they want to incorporate them. And alignment with curriculum will be focused as time zone reintroduction is considered. I think what people, we, we were getting more pushback, what I could tell at the meeting was more of, this is one other opportunity, I'm not going to be able to be in the classroom. Um, but as we are aligning our district's curriculum throughout the grades, this seems like a natural revisitation. The online directory is up and running for all APT members. I highly recommend it. It is an app on my phone at this point. If you haven't done it, do it. Um, kindergartners had a great welcome with yard signs, t-shirts, and play dates. Community service day is for eighth graders is scheduled for October 24th. Some places they will be serving are Bernie's, Dickinson Hall, and others. And the next meeting will be Wednesday, October 8th at 9 a.m. at West Campus. I had announced um, last month that some of their meetings would be held at Croya. They will not be held at Croya. They will be held here. And since we're all going at some point, you want to be here. So Mike will be attending on behalf of the Board of Ed as a rotating um, guest. And um, I did send out a communication that outlined um, some of the forms that we're going to follow, which entail really focusing on some of your committee roles. So I've gotten a few questions and comments on that. I appreciate those, and if you have any going forward, please feel free to contact me. Thank you. Uh, have you sent out dates to board members when they're supposed to attend? Yes, I have. Excellent, okay. I'll check my email for that. Okay. And Bill, you will not be going. You know this, correct? Uh, I'm not going? No, you're not. He, oh. he can go. Unless you wanted to fight Rob yeah, for it. No. <laughs> okay. Um, questions or comments from board members? All right. uh, thank you, uh, Leslie. We now move to action items. The first is the adoption of the 2014-2015 budget. Uh, we had a discussion earlier. Would Jen or Alan like to add anything to the previous discussion? No, as Jen said, no, no changes are recommended. Uh, we feel good about the budget. It's balanced in numerous ways as far as the projects we're doing, instructional initiatives, okay. and we'd recommend approval. Thank you. May I have a motion to adopt the 2014-2015 District 67 budget? So moved. Second. May I have a roll call vote, please, Madam Clerk? Mr. Volker. Aye. Mr. Lemke? Aye. Mrs. Clemenson? Aye. Mr. Anderson? Aye. Mrs. Fisher? Aye. Mr. Schuler? Aye. Mr. Borkowski? Aye. Motion carries. Okay, the next item on the agenda is, uh, relates to refinancing some of the district's debt or, or giving the, um, the board president and the Chief Financial Officer, the uh, option to do that under certain circumstances. Alan, would you like to discuss this at all before we vote on it? Uh, briefly, for many years, debt management advice has been provided to the district by Elizabeth Hennessy from William Blair, and on a regular basis, William Blair monitors the markets and advises us when there are opportunities to be taken. 
an opportunity to refinance our 04 and 05 general obligation debt certificates has presented itself. And I'd like to point out that we're not extending the length of the repayment. Uh, the issuance is for the purpose of reducing our scheduled interest expenses. Liz is here to provide an overview of the debt certificate resolution and recap of Moody's rating call that we participated in last week. So Liz, I'm going to ask you to step to the podium. Good evening. Um, just a brief outline of the debt certificate resolution. It authorizes up to 6.6 .6 million of debt certificates to refund the series 2004 and 2005 outstanding debt certificates. Um, as Alan mentioned, it does not extend the life or shorten it. It's exactly in proportion to the current repayment schedule. The current expected savings are about $564,000, so those are operational savings because, as you know, the debt certificates are paid from the O&M fund. And the resolution is the uh, only formal action the board would have to take to move forward with the sale. Um, it authorizes the refunding as long as the savings uh, have a minimum savings of 3% present value as a percent of the bonds refunded. So that's the minimum savings target. Right now we're at about 8.4% on that ratio. So we're, we're well above it. And um, uh, as mentioned, the um, board president and uh, deputy superintendent are authorized to finalize the sale. In terms of the process, we met with uh, over the telephone with Moody's Investor Service last week, and today we were um, pleased to receive confirmation of the AAA bond rating. So we will be mailing the official statement tomorrow and marketing the bonds uh, next week. Thank you. Are there questions or comments from board members? Um. I guess this is as close to free money as you can get because we, as Elizabeth pointed out, we're not taking on any more risk by going longer term. We're not uh, going to a floating rate versus fixed rate. It's just we're taking advantage of lower interest rates <clears throat> as soon as we can and as much as we can and rates are down. So we save 558 or $564,000 over a couple of years. That's good money. Um, also, Bill wanted me to point out that um, Jennifer and Alan will be calling when, this, when it comes time to setting this up. We'll be getting uh, competitive uh, quotes. Is that fair? Do you want to, do you want to give Could an you? overview of the reporting process and when we go to market and how we? Sure. Price? Um, we're pursuing, uh, I, I think you're talking about the marketing of the bonds, a negotiated sale. Yes. Um, where we're going to be marketing the bonds to uh, bank qualified investors because we're issuing less than 10 million. Uh, banks get an extra tax deduction to buy this. So we will be talking to all the local Lake Forest banks as well as bank purchasers here, here in Illinois and uh, going through a public sale, a competitive process, which I liken to uh, eBay for bonds, where on a maturity by maturity basis, investors will compete. Those who provide the lowest uh, interest rate will be rewarded with that order. So it's an order period, again, kind of like eBay, and so that's the competitive nature of the interest rate um, negotiation. Liz, historically, though, we've also then afterwards done a recap of where we issued the bonds in comparison with other similar deals um, that were done. So would you, would you sure. talk to that? Sure. Thanks, Alan. We will be providing um, the district which uh, and the board with a comparable pricing analysis, which is going to look at other AAA-rated issuers in the market at the same time before, during, and after the sale with your final savings results as well. So you'll have that report. Sorry, I wasn't that, that's answering sure Bill's question too. That's good. Okay. Other question, questions from board members? 
Thank you very much. All right, thanks. Um, may I have a motion uh, on this matter? Um, so moved, and I should read this uh, verbatim. Uh, parameters resolution. I move that Lake Forest School District 67 Board of Education adopt a resolution authorizing and providing for the issue of not to exceed <clears throat> $6,600,000 of general obligation limited tax refunding debt certificates. Series 2014 of Lake Forest School District number 67, Lake County, Illinois. <clears throat> evidencing the rights to payment under installment purchase agreements for the purpose of refunding certain outstanding debt certificates of said school district and providing for the security for and means of payment under the agreement of these, these certificates. Can we have a second? We yeah, may have a second. <laughs> second. Thank you. Roll call vote, please, Madam Clerk. Mr. Lemke. Aye. Mr. Borkowski. Aye. Mr. Schuler. Aye. Mrs. Clemenson? Aye. Mr. Anderson? Aye. Mrs. Fisher? Aye. Mr. Folker? Aye. Motion carries. Thank you very much. Next item on the agenda, approval of the uh, Michigan State um, contract for Mandarin teachers. Yeah, this is an item that we could have actually had in the consent uh, agenda along with the the following one on the, the charm foundation this is uh, a, a requirement in order to contract with one of our mandarin teachers that uh, we have an agreement through michigan state university uh, actually winds up costing us less than uh, than a teacher because of the uh, the agreement that that we have with them so uh, just the, teacher is in place and this is just part of the mechanism for making that all happen. Thank you very much. Questions or comments from board members? Hearing none, may I have a motion um, to approve the MSU contract for Mandarin teacher? So moved. Second. Second. Roll call vote please, Madam Clerk. Mr. Borkowski? Aye. Mr. Schuler? Aye. Mrs. Clemenson? Aye. Mrs. Fisher? Aye. Mr. Lemke? Aye. Mr. Folker? Aye. Mr. Anderson? Aye. Motion carries. Next item on the agenda, approval of the Linmore Coaching Services contract. Uh, Mr. Simic. Yes, this is actually part of the emotional wellness through the Charmed Foundation. Uh, this uh, uh, is another item I believe we could have just had in the consent agenda. This is an ongoing uh, partnership that we have with Charmed, and it's particularly important this year because we have some new people working in emotional wellness as a, a coaching function. Questions or comments from board members? Hearing none, could I have a motion to approve the Linmore Coaching Services contract? So moved. Second. Second. Roll call vote, please, Madam Clerk. Mrs. Fisher? Aye. Mr. Lemke? Aye. Mr. Anderson? Aye. Mr. Folker? Aye. Mr. Borkowski? Aye. Mr. Schuler? Aye. Mrs. Clemenson? Aye. Motion carries. Next item is approval of press issue 85 and issue 86 policy updates. Uh, Mr. Borkowski. These are what we discussed earlier. Um, these are all recommended by the ISB and or required by the statute. Um, there's two batches, number 85 and number 86. They cover things such as insurance management, environmental issues, home and hospital instruction, student support services, student teachers, and others. Uh, I recommend that we pass these. May I have a motion uh, to approve press issue 85 and 86 policy updates? So moved. Second. Second. Uh, roll call vote, please. Or do we need a roll call vote on this? Yeah. Uh, roll call vote, please, Madam Clerk. Mr. Borkowski? Aye. Mr. Lemke? Aye. Mrs. Clemenson? Aye. Mr. Anderson? Aye. Mrs. Fisher? Aye. Mr. Schuler? Aye. Mr. Folker? Aye. Motion carries. Item F, approval of release of executive session minutes from December 17, 2013 through June 24, 2014. I may have a motion uh, for approval. So moved. Second. Second. Do board members have any questions or comments? Hearing none, may I have a roll call vote, please, Madam Clerk? Mr. Folker? Aye. Mrs. Fisher? Aye. Mr. Schuler? Aye. Mrs. Clemenson? Aye. Mr. Borkowski? Aye. 
Mr. Lemke? Aye. Mr. Anderson? Aye. Motion carries. Approval of the accurate biometric fingerprinting contract. It's a good name for a company. Um, are there questions? You wouldn't want the inaccurate one. Uh, are there, uh, uh, Mr. Simic? Yeah, we tried the scatter shot biometric fingerprinting, but we weren't able to find them. Uh, you're right. Uh, this is a, a change of a contractor for fingerprinting to try to, to speed our fingerprinting process um, along, get it done more quickly. I recommend its approval. I have a motion to approve the. Right. What's the current cost, just out of curiosity? Ten dollars. Cool. It, it does say in the contract that they may increase the price per fingerprint by the amount of the increase of the CPI for the previous 12 months or 5%. Does that mean they'll always go 5%? So we're looking at a 5% increase every year for three years? It says they may. It doesn't say it's they not will. A maximum. No. Why? Why wouldn't you? <laughs> well, because you might lose the bid. But it's you're in for three years. It's a three-year agreement. So oh, we're gonna, it's going to go up 15 percent in three years. I, it's going to be 65, 66 dollars per person. Thank you very much. Uh, may I have a motion? <laughs> Would board members like to discuss this anymore? <laughs> I move we pass this contract. Do they do like retina scanning? Because that's cooler. Okay. All right. May I have a motion to approve the accurate biometric fingerprinting contract? So moved. And a second. Second. Roll call vote, please, Madam Clerk. Mr. Schuler? Aye. Mr. Folker? No. Mrs. Clemenson? Aye. Mrs. Fisher? Aye. Mr. Lemke? Aye. Mr. Borkowski? I'm just going to vote with Jeff. Mr. Aye. Anderson? Aye. Motion carries. The next item on the agenda is approval of human resource items. These are included in the packet, include hiring, resignations, terminations, family and medical leave absence, and change in status. May I have a motion to approve the human resources items? So moved. May I have a second? Second. May I have a roll call vote, please, Madam Clerk? Mrs. Clemenson? Aye. Mr. Lemke? Aye. Mr. Anderson? Aye. Mr. Folker? Aye. Mr. Borkowski? Aye. Mr. Schuler? Aye. Mrs. Fisher? Aye. Motion carries. The next item on the agenda is the consent agenda. Uh, there are items A through I. They include approval of disbursements, payrolls and financial statements, approval of recognition of schools application, adoption of first Midwest Bank resolution, minutes of a regular meeting from July 22nd, minutes of a board workshop July 22nd, minutes of a joint board workshop from September 10th. Uh, amended minutes of an executive session, amended minutes of a special session, and disposal of audio recordings. Are there any items on the consent agenda which a board member would like removed for further consideration? Hearing none, may I have a motion to approve the consent agenda? So moved. A second. Second. Roll call vote, please, Madam Clerk. 
Mrs. Fisher? Aye. Mr. Lemke? Aye. Mrs. Clemenson? Aye. Mr. Anderson? Aye. Mr. Borkowski? Aye. Mr. Schuler? Aye. Mr. Folker? Aye. The motion carries. We have FOIA requests from uh, Ms. Laura Rukavina, Sarah Collins, and Lenny Jarrett. Jarrett. Um, announcements, Monday, October 13th is Columbus Day, no school. Friday, October 17th is the Spirit of 67 Fall Luncheon at Exmoor. Wednesday, October 22nd, um, late start, DPM only, 1035. Tuesday, October 28th, Board of Education meeting, that's us, 7 p.m. right here. Uh, next item is adjournment. May I have a motion uh, to adjourn the meeting? So moved. Still moved. We have a second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Hearing none, the meeting is adjourned.